Welcome back for the third part of NMRA X here in August. Uh, I'm Speed. I'm not at the bottom of the helix. I'm sitting outside in the waiting room for the Austin train show, which I will run to right after this. Uh, today we have a two-part clinic, first time we've ever done that. And so uh, let me introduce uh, our first clinician, fascinated by trains from the age of six and active model railroad for 40 plus years. His primary hobby focuses on building modular benchwork and teaching prototype based operations, primarily timetable and train order style operations. And he's also the co-creator of the Operations Roadshow Layout and Teaching Program. So please welcome today with us, John Young. Thank you, Speed. Uh, that was uh, a nice introduction. Uh, I am one of the co-builders of the Operations Roadshow. Uh, we've made a number of trips to national conventions, uh, teaching timetable and train order. We decided to retire that layout back in 2018. Uh, the layout had gotten old, and so had the owners of the layout, and uh, thought we were out of the uh, operations teaching business. But uh, Gordy Robinson uh, liked the idea and wanted to re-establish uh, it. And for the St. Louis Convention, he uh, brought forward that idea. Um, the Operations Roadshow, being shown here at one of our home layout operating sessions with our uh, North Central Region uh, Board of Directors, had done eight different uh, uh, national conventions where we gave clinics. Uh, we had built a uh, dedicated layout to doing this and uh, moved it around quite a bit. Uh, here we're at our last convention in Kansas City, and you can see what we would do. Uh, we would have two-man crews. Uh, we'd send a docent with them to help guide them along the layout. Uh, in this picture, you can see our chief dispatcher, Jeff Ryman, and my wife, Cindy Young, who is our operator, and uh, how we would conduct a session. Uh, groups of guys working their way around the layout. Uh, it was a rather light, well, it still is a rather large layout, 400-foot mainline, eight primary cities, but with a lot of distance between those towns so that you'd have the idea of isolation. Uh, I've always enjoyed uh, teaching operations. Uh, I started out my career as a teacher, uh, got misguided into fact manufacturing for a number of years. So uh, let's take a look at what we ended up doing here. Uh, this is the Operations Roadshow layout. Uh, you can see the general size of it. But this had to morph into something else to continue on. And so we. We did St. Louis with a very limited layout, and it went well enough that the Fremo N folks decided to take on the project with us. And this is the layout we presented in Dallas, Texas, back in 2013, or 2023. Roughly speaking, it's a layout of about 54 feet by 66 feet. I have a 320-foot main line on it. I volunteered to build one of the staging yards that would be needed for the layout. Uh, unfortunately, the gentleman that was going to build the second staging yard had to pa uh, pass on it about 10 weeks before the convention. So uh, Lee Culkins, our uh, leader on setting up the layout, uh, asked me to produce not one but two of the uh, staging yards. So my requirements were, this all had to fit in my minivan with three people traveling in it with us. Uh, modules for me had to be lightweight. I'm 70 years old and I don't lug things around like I used to do. I wanted the uh, legs to be permanently attached to the modules themselves. I wanted them to sit on casters so they were easy to move into position. And since I don't crawl around on floors that well anymore, the levelers had to be some system that could be adjusted from a standing position. This is an illustration of what I suggested to Lee initially for the one staging yard I was going to make. It's uh, seven tracks. 
Uh, it has a run-through track in the middle, a double ladder to it. I was not sure what would be fed beyond it as far as if there would be any turning facilities or a return loop, but it ended up with a return loop. After Lee made his request to me, this is what it ended up being. Uh, when he made the request, I had one uh, ladder track had been built, one body track had been built. I built the uh, second ladder to match the first and then built yet another body track. So this is what we had for the fiddle yards for both ends of that layout. Uh, the track center lines on this are one and a half inches, so it was easier to reach in and manipulate cars to be loading them. Now, these yards are exclusively to be used as staging yards. They're not intended to be classification yards or uh, yards of service, say, industries in any other way. Uh, they are to stage full trains to be used on the layout. Here's a bit of the construction. I use very lightweight materials. Uh, 5.2 millimeter Luon for the majority of the materials. Only the end plates are three quarter inch plywood. Uh, I like the Luon in a vertical position is very stable. Primarily everything is glued together. The only thing that gets nailed together are the three quarter inch um, end plates to the side plates. You'll notice the uh, curve module I have to the side here. I included that to give better il illustration. Now we're looking at the top of both of these modules. I am creating six-sided boxes with uh, longitudinal and lateral support beams. I'm trying to support the upper deck with no more than a one-foot span from the support area around it because it is so thin a material. The uh, 5.2 millimeter materials I've used are intended as floor underlayment. So generally they don't have a very good strength in their thickness. But like I said, set on edge, they are quite strong. Uh, they create a very lightweight box and uh, it is solid. It reserves uh, twisting, racking very, very well. Um, personally, I have built, I think, roughly 80 modules in my 40 years in the hobby. I've built N-Track modules that were the standard construction method in 1980 of three-quarter inch plywood and half inch plywood decking. Uh, they were quite heavy. Uh, I was a younger man. I could still whip them around pretty well back then. But uh, it's an unreasonable amount of weight, in my opinion, at this point in time. Uh, so I have gone this way for construction. I got the idea from the Sipping and Switching Society of North Carolina. They've been using this kind of construction now uh, so well over 30 years. And they've had a lot of success with it. And... So that, that's the uh, system I have followed along with. It's a little closer detail to one of the boxes. You'll notice that I don't depend on just the butt joint being glued together. I also put reinforcing blocks in all of the butt joints and anywhere there's a connection. Uh, that's very important to making this kind of construction work. You'll also notice in the middle of this picture there's another three-quarter inch piece of plywood that is incorporated inside the box itself. This is the support structure for the hinges I'm going to use to hang the leg legs to the module. Uh, it's very necessary to have this much meat to meet that need. They are also, the legs are not at the ends of the modules. I've set them back a bit to make it easier to reach around and hook up wires and get clamps in there so they're not interfering with any of the leg structure. The modules themselves are 15 inches wide, uh, six foot, or excuse me, five feet long. So this setback, roughly 10 inches from the end, 
still allows the legs to swing up and be completely underneath the module and out of the way in transport. On the end of this module, you'll also see that there's a hole and also a slot. Since I'm painting the ends of these, and I've had the experience of modules sticking after being connected for quite a while, I left myself a slot where I could slide a flat screwdriver up in there and break the adhesion between the two modules. The uh, hole you see there is an alignment pin. There'll be an aluminum uh, piece of rotting goes through there and permanently attached so that it aligns to the module next to it in the module set. When I get to clamping, to get the final surfaces on, I don't have clamps big enough, but I do have lots of bottles of water that I can spread across that upper surface and get everything to set up. Uh, the one criticism I have of this construction system is, since everything has to glue, uh, it gets spread over too many days. Uh, I've built modules of this size, and I can do it in a morning. Just cut everything out and nail them together. Uh, gluing, you have to give the glue enough time to actually be finished and completely set. There might be another detail that you can notice here, that the uh, module box, I do not try to cut the upper and lower deck pieces to perfect alignment. I make them oversized, I glue everything together, and then I go back over them with a router to get the final shape and edging on them. Uh, it's much faster, it gives a much cleaner look to the whole operation. We have the throat design here. We're working with uh, Atlas Code 55 track. Uh, number sevens are the minimum mainline switches allowed in the Fremo standards, so that's what I use to build this yard. With the one and a half inch track spacing, I found that you had to space the uh, individual turnouts with a three inch piece of track to get that proper spacing. I hadn't built in this size and in this scale very much yet, so that distance did kind of uh, surprise me. Uh, in the other picture, you'll see what the end plates look like. Uh, I painted most of the module with latex paint. Everything was primed and then it was finished painted afterwards. But the end plates I spray painted with flat black paint. I thought that would have less chance of getting a, an adhesive type surface. Uh, you'll notice that I used oversized slide switches as the turnout controls. I try to keep things simple. And since you're going to be close to the tracks anyway, I personally didn't feel there was a need for a tortoise type switch machine at all. So this is the method I used. Here's a little bit better detail of it. The button there was an idea I got off of Sean Franklin in St. Louis. He had very much smaller slide switches to fit scenically in his layout, but I went to a larger switch so it would be more readily, easily manipulated without too much effort. Uh, Connection is just a piece of bent wire. This is a short look at what the module looks like standing independently. You can see how narrow the legs are on it. Uh, this is a little illustration of the builder, and you can see the hinges and the construction of the legs to a certain extent. To get the leveling feature I needed, I constructed these legs in such a way they attach to the hinge, that block of wood has a 7 8 inch dowel in it that is center drilled to accept a threaded nut. And then into that, I glued a piece of quarter inch bolt material that's six inches long. The wooden leg itself also has a threaded nut in it. And that wraps up on the six inch threaded rod, giving me at least four inches of uh, elevation change I could put into it. On the right-hand picture, you can see one little silver screw there in that black rod. That's holding a 10-inch long piece of aluminum tubing there to help give guidance to the 7 8 inch wooden rod, uh, keep it from wobbling around very much. Here's the casters on the end. They're just cheap furniture casters, the least expect expensive one I could find on Amazon that had a 2-inch wheel. 
You might also notice there that there's a uh, silver part right at them. I added that aluminum tubing to it at the end of the wooden rods to keep the uh, bolt from blowing through the wood itself. That just helps reinforce that wood. My wiring would be crude by certain people's standards, but I have been resistant to ever using screw terminals under a module. Transportation and screw terminals do not seem to be a good combination in my experience, so I would rather hardwire it and check every wire as I connect it so I know it's right. Uh, you can also see in the right-hand picture, a friend of mine 3D printed these uh, holders for a double female connector to carry the DCC bus. And uh, I put them on a red block so they're easier to identify as you're making the connections. In the left-hand picture, you can see my un unfinished wiring for the slide switches to control the frogs. Uh, if I ever get the modules back from the guy who's holding on to them right now, I will complete that task. You'll see the uh, this is a pair of modules being racked up, ready to ship to Evanston. See some of the details of the legs and some of the wiring here in the picture. And then here is a picture of the racking system idea I stole from the Maju Track people up in northern Chicago. They have built a number of identical racks that they uh, attach to their modules with that uh, hand knob there. It's just a quarter 20 uh, connector. And they stack their modules, sometimes six high, to transport. The, each of these end plates has a keying system, so the modules sit firmly on top of one another. And then once they have a stack pulled together, they loop a uh, ratchet tie down between the handles you see it just snug it all down so it's in the uniform block um, to that idea I added having casters on the bottom of the lower block of uh, modules that way I can more easily move them around when I'm at a uh, module site setup site uh, for this yard it was necessary to face the two modules together. You wouldn't want to do that with a scenic module, but uh, with this yard that will never have scenery on it, that was safe for me to do. It uh, cut down on the overall height of the stack and made it possible for me to slip them in my personal minivan to transform them down to Dallas. Took this picture Outside of my construction garage, uh, to get an idea of what the four modules look like all set up together, um, the layout stands on those thin legs and is relatively stable. But the legs themselves turned out to be uh, one of the negative learning things that came out of this construction technique. Like I said, I've built a number of modules and I have built all sorts of leg systems along the way. Some of them have been very awkward to attach. Some have been hugely too heavy for the application. Uh, this worked, and it worked well. It worked the way it designed. But it wasn't as stable as I'd have liked it to been. And I think the next permutation of this, I am going to cross-connect the adjacent modules on each position so they don't have the side-to-side -side, um, movement that this system seems to offer. I think they're steady enough end-to-end -to, -end to keep from being a problem, but uh, they just skipped around too badly. Um, this is our setup in Dallas and the layout uh, stage for the next operating session. Uh, it was easy to fill this yard. It's got a number of um, tracks in in the yard that lets you uh, just, you know, get the cars on the track. You'll also notice to the left side of this picture, since this was an operations-based layout, uh, every one of these trains was named in some way and had a destination. Those cards leaning against them is the designation for that particular train before it leaves. Here is how the uh, 
Um, one of these yards was used in the Evanston setup. Loaded up with passenger trains. So, thank you. Um, I had a number of le learnings from building these particular modules. This was the first time I actually used the lightweight techniques that I've been looking at for a number of years. And I am quite pleased with the way they came out. Um, I think the openings I left have been adequate in them. The top decking concerns me a little bit. I'm not sure that it would survive remaining flat after you put a lot of scenery material on top of it. So I think in my future construction, I'll build the boxes the same way, but I'm going to plan on putting a uh, half inch or three quarter inch piece of plywood as the sub row bed down before I put the track on. I think that would remain stable no matter what happens to the top deck of the module itself. I mentioned the legs as being less than what I'd hoped they would be. Uh, the module, module track people in Chicago have a different leg system where they um, have a construction type that they use that same knob just to clamp the leg in place. And I'm going to experiment with that and see if that better serves needs of these kind of layouts. So, indeed, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. Um, I'm not going to introduce myself. There might be a slide with some information. Um, so if G4 ever sees this video, I'm going to give him a run for his money because you're about to see 80 slides in a few seconds. So here's the yard that I built. The next page, who am I? And maybe I'm living in the bottom of the helix, except for today. And I'm also the IT manager in the NMRX scheduler. Today we're discussing how we build our separate yards, plenty of photos, the why, the ideas, the plan, the execution, and maybe a few tips or tricks and a few things you should not do. Um, why did I build this? Well, the Operations Roadshow, as John explained, had volunteers and modules, and then the modules retired. So 2022, they got Fremo in to build them a layout to do Operations Roadshow, and in 2023, they asked um, Fremo in again, but there was not going to be enough yards to operate in and out of. So I was somehow voluntold to build the yard. And even though I... Uh, vehemently protested. At some point, the Amazon and the brown boxes just kept piling up on my front door, and all the turnouts and track and parts just started uh, showing up. So, what kind of yard do you build? Because we do want a classification yard, but shall we go for something like this that needs about $12,000 in turnout, or maybe something more um, recent, the Englewood Yard in Houston, or do I just opt for the yard that's currently in my home country, uh, right by what we call Independence Avenue uh, in Ventuk? So uh, the final track plan ended up being uh, looking like this, where different to a staging yard, you need a, a, a yard lead that is long enough to pull to pull a, a length of uh, cars out of your out of your yard. It was designed so that if we do split it in the middle, as the green line shows, that we could park it at the end of uh, Fremo in layout and then show or, or use it as a, a staging yard. Now, here's the hiccup, where these two tracks end on the left side and the right side. Uh, a normal Fremo inner would think, oh, he has double mainline track there. So how will we just use that as double mainline track? So as Lee will explain to you, we have many discussions on why that is not an arrival or departure track, that is the lead for the yard. So um, it is built so that if we add more modules in the middle, the straight sections, then we just need another double mainline module to extend the lead. So before we go there, I need to show you that we're, the system grew by adding another little module on the left side in order to go to another yard that uh, was going to be in uh, uh, modeling the uh, Galveston uh, Santa Fe yard, and so the gentleman there needed a lead as well. So if we zoom in a little bit, the only important part is the purple and yellow part here, where you can see the, the ladders, and then 
the little stubby track there was intended for caboose, caboose and now today it's a, a field track and on the top right hand side in the orange and green you'll see the nine places where we can um, park engines in the in the engine facility. So the idea is here if you look at the 6S number at the bottom left that's where the main line comes in then you ignore that crossover there that has a special purpose tell you a bit in a second and then the next turnout is for you to enter the yard either as uh, the arrival or when you leave as departure and of course there's two tracks so you need to be able to get to both of them and therefore the two crossovers there. Now back to the one on the left that crossover is for anybody who builds their train in the yard. We always have these people that want to build 200 car trains and so if they set it up in this yard how do they leave the yard if they don't have a way to escape? So that's the only purpose of that uh, crossover on the left side and the same thing happens on the green module on the far right. So uh, you'll notice that the ladder has a name to it. All the tracks are actually named to everybody who invested in this project. I call them shareholders. So that was the final plan. So here we go. The builder, uh, Jeff Reichel offered to build these for us for a small fee, cabinet grade plywood, and build them into boxes like this so they can take a two inch piece of foam um, with the cross members simply helping to keep the straight long straight edges uh, together um, and then the, the thick pieces on the left and the far right uh, to to be able to stand the clamping that we do between modules um, why did i pick 18 by 50 inches because any civilian car in this country will take an 18 by 50 even if you stack another one on top of it and you have the inch and a half plywood with the bolts to keep them slightly separate from each other. So there's the first six modules for the yard being built. You'll notice that we have these pins which is fairly expensive but they match the modules perfectly together each and every time. And then the other two sets of holes are for the for the for the the bolts to, to to connect them. So there I have all of them connected and um, it's strong enough that you could actually lift it up in the middle. I didn't do that for too long because I was worried about that center part there. So the bolt itself, once you put the foam on, you gotta get that foam cut in both directions. And once you have it uh, down, you'll see the second part, the foam is a little higher. We deliberately did not make the uh, the height two inches we made it 1.85 so that we have to cut the foam off because foam does not come in a, in a standard uh, height so I had to uh, invent a little uh, band saw bow saw thing with a hot wire in it so I could cut the, uh, the foam this way and one of the lessons is don't ever stop in the middle of this when your wire is hot so once you have them all glued together. You can put some paint on the sides. Um, you can put paint on top as well. That was not the smartest idea, but at least we used the Texas Sun to, to keep that dry for us. Okay, on top of the wooden edges on the end plates, we uh, used these little laser cut MDF pieces to give us the, the height, and then I made a set of PC boards to uh, solder the rail to. Now, Lesson learned, do not use MDF because it will soak up humidity and expand. So that's how the PC boards come. Um, for anybody who's interested, I order these in bulk so that we uh, save on shipping and then I forward them on to you at cost. You just pay the $4 shipping and handling to, to get your own uh, few PC, PC boards. So once you glue them down, you need to make sure they go perfectly flattened down. So use some weights and some spacers underneath and then you can see the final product there on the bottom right. So this project is not done by me alone. I had at least nine or ten people helping directly and indirectly and so you can see how uh, we employed people to, uh, to help build this thing and here is the first four modules and then uh, three more for some future project that we will do another clinic on came later. You also need to store it somewhere, so I had to install some shelving in my garage to take uh, to take this because I already have a two-car garage layout above this uh, two-car garage, and there's no room there for modules, so modules had to go in the garage. Um, this is how we glued the foam to the wood, some uh, 
good old XT, XP and, and AT computers. Um, you also need to cut a hole in the foam to get access to that knob, otherwise uh, you only do it with two fingers, which is not enough. I eventually would use a, a drill, uh, elect electric drill and a, and a bolt instead of the, the hand knobs. Uh, then comes the time when you need to glue the cork on, and thank you to David and Tom for showing up to help here. Um, cork needs weight, so you got to weigh this all down, wait for it to dry. Uh, some more cork, cutting the pieces that forms the yard. Of course, the main line has to be slightly uh, higher as well, so that's also uh, taken care of. And then how do we know where the track goes? Well, I printed all the interfaces one-to-one -one so that uh, so we could mark them straight on the places they needed to go. Now, of course, it's not perfect to the NRL drawings we made, and that's okay because uh, where in the world do you get perfectly straight track? So as life goes on, you always have to add something more. You can see the Y that David Hager was building for the Galveston Yard, and he needed a yard lead, so I decided to use a seventh module to give him a lead in that double section of the Y, and then we would just have to cross over for the main to go to the single track on his far right-hand side. So that's the crossover that you see there. Okay, once the cork is in, um, I do not use the beveled cork because I think it's just a little expensive. So we just cut it straight and then we just added some Lowe's play sand to cover up the, the corners. So nothing gets done if you don't eat. So thank you to uh, my wife for helping us out here. Um, there's some photos on how we built this, how we spaced it up, assembled it. There's the whole yard with half the cork not in yet in my driveway. Um, John mentioned the one and a half inches, how you have to extend it. Um, in Fremo N, the uh, double main line actually has to be one and an eighth of an inch. So you have to cut some track uh, on the turnouts to make this happen. So that was a, a lesson learned. Did not expect that to happen, but we managed. Um, here's how we uh, saw it to the end. Then we started building the ladder. And of course, you have a... You have, a, you have a big project and not a lot of space and you can't get all seven modules together at the same time, so sometimes you have to revert back a little bit. So there's more photos of the ladder. Then the cork is not always the same thickness and neither is the foam underneath, so we had to use some putty to, uh, to smooth out the differences and make sure that it's level when you, when you put, the, put the rail on. Of course, all the rail needs electricity, so these PC boards were also designed to have little holes in them, so we could solder wires to it, or bring the wire over the middle tie there, as you can see, um, to bring electricity to the track. Um, to isolate them, initially I used the um, plastic rail joiners, but at some point they just look ugly and it's hard to slide a tie underneath, so eventually we removed all of them and just left a small gap while knowing that the track is nicely glued down with the ballast. Um, all my turnouts I like to have uh, under eventual dispatch control or select a route. I only want to say go to track three and I want all the turnouts to align, which means you need some form of electricity to uh, help you. So I install servers on the edge of the modules, which you'll see in the next few slides. So that's how we mark where the throw bar needs to be uh, connected by a piano wire. And so imprint on the side of the module with the servo, then we cut a hole in there so that the foam holds the servo, as you can see over here. Now, eventually I discovered that I did not have to cut that bigger slot at the top. I just need a piece for the wire to go, go down to the servo because the servo is far enough down that the wire going to the servo is the spring that you need not to push too hard into the turnout. So then you take a drill, make it uh, all the way there, and then you just simply use coffee stirrers to push them into each other to get you the, the the length. And there you can see the spring in the server. The server sits on the wood at the bottom, and the foam is neatly holding it in place while the server wire goes into a little little another groove there that's now being collapsed by the by the pressure to go underneath the the module. Okay, so there's a bunch of them installed, and uh, almost ready to uh, to test it out. So. Of course, you have the other the other ladder as well, and then there was a problem the height of the arrival and departure tracks. So we had to uh, pull some foam up 
uh, cork up and, and redo most of that. The, um, I had a few inspectors, I had a few people to help, and so it always helped if you know people that know more than you do and they can come, come uh, offer a third eye or a fourth eye to, uh, to make sure the work is done right. So I use these little pins to keep the track in place while the glue is drying um, or before we put the glue in so that when you put the weights on, the track doesn't move. So here we have some cars being rolled across the edges and along the turnouts. And I always like to flick a car the long way into a turnout to make sure it goes smoothly. And if it does derail, then we're not done yet. So I love uh, uncoupling magnets. We always uh, uh, keep the trip pins or the um, brake hoses, I think is what you call them. So I made this little laser cut guide so I can put a uh, Dremel tool with a offset gadget installed into it so you can get the little uh, recess part so that the magnets will sit perfectly there. Um, I used to buy all the rectangular uh, magnets I could find from Radio Shack, but since there are no more, uh, we discovered these neobdinium ones that you can get on Amazon, and the long way they do the same thing. Now, if you bring a car with pure metal wheels, your car is going to stay there. These magnets will uh, will definitely grab the car and and keep it hostage. So, and then. I always like to have rear railers before they go into or when they come out of turnouts so the, the rear railer would then sit right right in the middle of the magnet so I just have to color that one tie in yellow to indicate where the uncoupler is. Okay, we need some weights to, to glue things down. So uh, David brought some bricks over. So you might see a few more bricks in the next few slides or some other weights metal metal uh, blocks or cylindrical spindles and and motors to to help even solder is a good weight um, weathered all the track by spraying on this krylon camouflage uh, brown paint uh, interesting to note that the color of the paint is only written either on top or below the barcode there's nothing else on the bottle that tells you the color maybe the lid so laser cut uh, MDF for uh, spacing all these things to keep them at some uh, known spacing. Uh, this is what the wires look like underneath. It is not the Fremo N spec to have um, Ethernet or telephone wire carry your current, but since uh, this is only going a little bit, I'm not too worried that we're going to um, overheat a wire or something. There's also not 10 trains running at the same time into a classification yard. Um, you can see the clamps there on the on the other side. That just helps you keep the thing perfectly level. If you're uh, if you're already overheated in the Texas sun and your fingers can't grab the knobs there to to do the the best job. So uh, here's the straight tracks showing how we built those. Um, pin them down after you put the glue on and then find the weights to to cut them off. Now, when we get to the legs, these are three quarter inch uh, electrical conduit. And then I am not a fan of that tool. So I had to uh, beg a friend to come over and, 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 and cut those for me and, and grind them smooth. Because the regular conduit is a little cheaper if you buy it in 10 feet sections. And we only need it, I believe, 45 inches. So when we uh, use these leg holders, that you're supposed to use these tiny little screws to, to clamp them down, well, they do not work at all. So what we decided to do is 3D print the parts with the top capped and so that you can uh, adjust the thing at the bottom, which is not preferred either. And that little gadget there that was uh, invented by somebody gave me great trouble. So for the 2024 Evanston event, I printed some rubbery um, 3D prints that would clip over the bolt there. And then it's a lot easier to uh, to make sure that the, the plastic part underneath the bolt doesn't leave the system while you're traveling. So here's a photo of the mirror, because when you bring the left side to the right side, I thought that would be a cool artistic thing. You just need to crop it a little better. I also wanted to show the tools that we use. So solder iron, all the wires, stripping, tweezers, sharp blades, um, all the parts that we needed, the magnet cutting tools at the top, and of course the glue and the, and the alcohol in the bottle there, top left. 
uh, here's a few more tools flashlight some paint scissors always useful do not overuse a sharpie because when you put alcohol on it it runs so I actually have some track on my TX number layout that's fairly pink because I used a red sharpie to to indicate where I wanted the track so don't do that again okay so when it came time to 3d print all these leg things we had 13 3d printers running over the last 39 days before the convention so uh, thank you to all those who were willing to help so here's the uh, leg holders you can see the top is capped so that the leg doesn't go further than it should uh, maybe I need to insert a pin through the hole and through the leg so they don't fall out because I claim gravity is how we assemble this thing and if you pick the module up the legs will just drop out so you got to grab the legs and then pick the module up there's the uh, what I call the ankles and then the, the little parts to the left is what clicks over the feet as well so uh, the engine terminal we uh, decided fairly late that hey, maybe we can park nine sets of engines there and turn their power on and off so since we had a bit of time we decided to do that there's another view of it um, re-railers for a row to cross the, the, the yard here on one of the straight sections there's the wires on one of the ladders you can see uh, all the green wires are the frogs and all the other wires are color-coded in sequence so that when you put the the blue set then the orange set then the green set then the brown set you know you're doing track one two three four um, here's all the track in and glue down uh, put it back into the uh, driveway so we could run some trains over it different view of it that road that I said would go over the re-railers was done by using um, dust control which is some patch and repair compound Doo -doo -doo -doo. there's the road when it cracks the next day the cool thing about this uh, dust control is you squirt water on it and you smooth it out again and you can reshape it so until you paint it you can keep changing it really cool feature um, the underside uh, needs circuit breakers and frog juicers and note about the frog juicers they trip a little late so the circuit breaker goes first and then the frog juicer loses power and then it forgets what it was supposed to do so eventually we had to move all the frog juicers straight to the DCC bus um, here's the straight tracks uh, straight module just a simple uh, connection to the uh, to the um, circuit breaker and bottom left here is where we plug the servos in into the MQ trains uh, 16 channel servo controller that will be another clinic um, the power if you buy the real power pole ones you can certainly uh, invest into the lower cost um, knockoffs what you need to know is that even though those will plug into each other electrically they will not join by sliding them on top of or next to each other so if you pick one stick to it don't mix and match here's the underbuilt of the yard ladder here's another photo of the straight track and now the Texas heat has become so unbearable that my wife allowed me to to work in the dining room which you'll see a photo of later um, a few more people helping that's Jeff from Plano uh, here's where we put all the servos in for the yard connecting their uh, um, piano wires 3D printed the uh, place where you plug the throttle in because we just use a 2 to 1 um, local net connector then clamp a call it a, a template so we know where to drill the, the big hole and then laser cut the uh, fascia so that the screw holes and everything is perfectly aligned for you to to screw in the little plastic thing for the two to one connector to click in behind it so I call it the invasion so now I was occupying the dining room the front entrance of the house and almost three quarters of my wife's uh, hobby room so if you came to visit you would have to come in the front door slide in close the door and duck under or walk around the house and enter through the garage there's the, uh, the uh, another view of it 
with some of the ballast being being done. Here's some more tools for the plastic printed parts, voltmeter, drills, solder and lights. So I call these the, the indoor tools. The others were used outside. Um, we had to do some scenery because a yard is not a yard if it has no scenery. Now, of course, this yard has almost no scenery, but at least we put a few roads in and a building or two, a few cars. I had to have some people come over and test it. So some people flew in from Massachusetts to, to come help. Thank you, John. There is a, a few buildings that we added, getting some of the scenery done. Now, most people think that this is Africa. It could just as well be, uh, but it's called the Murphy Yard because that's where this was built and designed. So what we did not cover today will be a future clinic is MQTT that run this whole thing. MQ trains the hardware we use in the software, the pages, that were, the HTML JavaScript to design and show these panels, which you touch on a tablet, the electronics that run this be below, and the E24 version of the same yard which had more ballast and uh, the better feet at the bottom. So I do want to say thank you to all these people who made it possible and at least a lot of fun. So here we go. Greg, Srini, Chris, David and David, Paul, Jeff, Tom, Michelle who even helped painted some of those early modules, uh, Robert, Eric and Jeff. So now there's a few more slides to show you the final at the convention in 2023 and here's the uh, I think it was the green module on the map and then on to the the next one that little tower there was apparently told that that is way out of date or out of location so we will move that to someone else's module the straight parts um, for some reason there were no cars in the layout when I took the photo so maybe they didn't use the yard at all um, there's the caboose track and then on to the uh, final part. And then we had another crossover to maintain the main line to go over to David's Y on the further side there. And I think that is the last slide. So to do this, plan early, do the weather, due to weather and the space you got, start early, yes, very early, ask for help, it does exist, buy extra parts, mistake happens. Uh, don't stray. Rabbits have their own holes. Test often. Bugs that you see sooner gets fixed quicker. And do not do this. Don't mix and match those connectors. As you can see, they don't sit all that well. Don't make a mess on top of your electronics because you've got to clean that up. Uh, take care of the weather. Don't do this in a rainstorm. Uh, on the top right, do not spray paint onto the pink foam. It eats into it. And do not leave anything that's really hot like a solder iron just on a module without its stand. That was my lessons learned. And if there's any questions, now would be a good time to ask them. And I will stop the share. Oops, Brad, that might have given you a black screen. Stop the screen share. So John, I do not see any questions. Do you put module scenery to scenery? Yes. So my modules were mounted face to face or scenery to scenery and then screwed with black end plates on there. Any questions from you, John? Uh, can I make you su some suggestions? Sure. Before you start drilling holes in your mounts for your legs, Experiment with using magnets to hold the leg up inside there. Uh, cool. I have built some modules since then. That uh, Now, my wooden legs are lighter than what your conduit legs are. But I found some 10-pound magnets that would hold those legs against a, a quarter-inch lag bolt. Very adequate. Oh, cool. cool. Uh, you know, it's good enough to pick the module up and move them around and keep them in there. But it's not that difficult to pull them out. Pull them out. Thank you. That's certainly something I would uh, just do. Don't even experiment. Cool. No, I have questions for you. I, I, I was amazed when I saw that in Dallas, the amount of technology and effort you'd put into those yards. 
<laughs> that you had so much help on it. <laughs> so uh, here's a scary story. We we uh, you, you come back from the Dallas convention, and then the yard goes back up in the garage, and the wireless router gets put somewhere, and the power supply for it gets separated from it, and then the oh. Raspberry Pi gets moved to another place, and then you need to borrow the SD card to go get a file off of it, and then you fast forward to the point where Gordy's in your house. We're packing the trailer. We need to go now, right? So we drove all the way to Evanston, and I did not have those pictures that show where you touch to have the yard for either the yard or for the greedy modules we built. So on site in place, I had to redraw all those and to get them up and running. So it shows that it can be done, but would I have done it the same way again? Of course not. No. So now there's a backup of the backup of the backup, and there's even one online so that I could download it from anywhere in the world um, yeah. to, to redo the yard. So. Yes. Yes, online is a great gift to humans in electronics. <laughs> cool. Nobody from the crowd. Any questions? Doot, 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 doot. Brad, do you have any questions? Thank you for asking, Speed. I was waiting. Uh, is there, when you design a yard for a traveling layout, is there any design points that differ from being a home layout yard? take into account? I would say yes, in, in, in as much as I've, I've seen what people do when they, when they show up at the yard and they unpack their stuff. I, I cannot plant flowers and grass and put very intricate um, detail um, like a real yard would have had. You know, like if I would put a water tank to, to water the, the um, uh, steam engines those little details gets destroyed in a hurry I mean people just show up at the yard and they put their elbow right on top of the track and you're like just glad there wasn't a car underneath it so so there is some thought to where you put things and how you protect it from from the traveling people that travel with with the yard now for the design itself it has the same principles as any operating yard because that's really what we like to do is to operate it's not it's not to just see trains leave and, and, and come back unless it's a staging yard and you want to put stuff there. Um, so all my yards at, on my home layout has a yard lead long enough to pull all the cars out and to, to put, put the whole lead back in or grab all the cars from the arrival track and put it somewhere else. So, so I did the same stuff for that. Engine facility, the caboose track that's now a fuel track, the same idea. Um, so not not way different for Fremo N people who like to operate, um, but I I did notice that if if I'm going to do some serious scenery, then it's got to be a, away from the edge. Uh, speed uh, as far as scenery goes, do you have experience with uh, using a uh, static rash yet? Not yet. Uh, okay, uh, it is the gift to us guys who do modules because it is durable beyond what you thought it could possibly be. That's Our good news. Uh, original Operation Roadshow was built probably five years before Flock became an, a thing, and we experimented with it on the edge of the layout, which was a foolish thing to do, that virtually everybody came into first and saw and touched. And unbelievably, it has stayed good for 20 years with people oh, wow. dragging their hands through it intentionally, leaning on it by mistake. Uh, yeah, I'm really happy with it. Now, that particular area was put down with full-strength white glue underneath it. And okay. I was really careful to concentrate on making sure the flock stood up. So, But, yeah, it it's a, a godsend to the edge of our layouts. Now, I did hear a rumor that if you do attend the Novi... 2025 NMRA convention that there might be a chance to go see those modules? Yes, sir, there is. Uh, <laughs> we will be open on Thursday for the regular tour. Mm -hmm. uh, we also are going to host operating sessions both on Monday at noon and again on Thursday at 1 o'clock to 4. 
Oh, wow. So you'll have both a chance to operate on the original HO layout and to see the layout in its natural environment. And given a year, I might actually clean up the train room so it looks <laughs> presentable. No promise, but there is a chance. So you know somebody that knows somebody who has the layout? Uh, one of my closest <laughs> friends is the fellow who houses the layout. Uh, I'll, sh I'll share a little story about it. We built this layout expecting to have it stored all the time and just take it out a couple of times a year and play with it for a big, long weekend. Uh, about three years into the build, which was happening on the front porch of my 120-year-old house, uh, Jeff Fryman, who uh, now houses it, was living in literally a log cabin in the city of Celine. Uh, Celine would have been real happy for him to burn down the cabin. So uh, Jeff decided it was the time of his life he should build an actual adult home. <laughs> and uh, he took our drawn footprint of what that layout was going to be to an architect. The architect was told to create a basement to hold that layout and then put some bedrooms above it. And oh, that's wow. what he did. So that's he has a cool. custom-designed layout basement to hold this layout. It includes a crew lounge and a restroom area and another work area to maintain the layout. So uh, there's two more questions, but I have another question first. Are we going to have Operations Roadshow with Fremo in, in Nova as well? Yes, we are. I'm working on that with uh, Lee Calkins right now, getting some uh, modules organized to come in. Uh, there will have to be some fresh ones built. They, they have reduced the area that they first offered us down a little bit. Uh, it's not just going to be as generous as what we had in Dallas by any means. But we'll still be able to set up roughly a 22 or 23 foot wide layout, 50 or okay. 60 feet long. So it's cool. it's going to be more than adequate for having the operation okay. to build. Just let me know if I need to bring any of the Texas modules there. Here's the ah. questions. Is there a diagram of the legs from the first half of the presentation? Would you be willing to share your leg design? I do not have a diagram of that. Uh, I try to draw one up and realize my uh, ability is not there. Uh, what I will do, though, is I will put together a uh, mini clinic on how those legs were assembled. And okay. we'll offer it again in the future. Thank you. And then yeah. someone asked, is code 80 track standard with modular standards because of pizza cutter wheels? I believe we only do code 55. 55, yeah. So 55 is standard on Fremo N. Fremo N. Uh, on N track, 80 is standard. Mm -hmm. So. And then, and then I do know that there's a little controversy about the pizza cutter thing. I personally think if you like your things to derail on all the tenants that I have, then go ahead, bring your pizza cutters. If you like yeah. the click, 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 click noise, then that's also your choice. So, Well, I, I do not say this to be derisive, but Fremo N and the modelers who participate are trying to take the modeling to a higher level than just the standard engage track will handle. Correct. And uh, pizza cutter wheels just are not part of the mindset of modeling in this particular modular system. And does it look good? I don't think so. The, the peach cutters? No, yes. I don't think so either. Yeah. No. Cool. Well, John, thank you to, uh, to you for your help. Um, oh, I, I have a, a little sidebar to add to it. You know, you asked me to do this clinic when we were in Dallas, and I readily agreed, and that was great. <laughs> You walked away, and I forgot. So when you rattled my cage here a couple of months ago to say, hey, have you got your clinic ready? And I went, uh oh <laughs> uh, I was three days away from loading the entire set of modules into a trailer to send to Evanston, and I wasn't going to get them back anytime soon. I still haven't got them back. So <laughs> I had to scramble really hard to find any kind of pictures to do a presentation with. Well, thank you. And for those yeah. who missed Evanston, there was 450 modules there, and I believe another 150 in the T-Track and N-Track groups. And so we occupied, I think, 15,000 square feet. And it, it took me more than six hours to run my train across all the 
modules didn't even get to the island of Sodor. They had this little secret hideaway place where you couldn't get to. You had to, I call it three fingers. In, in HO, it's 050, and in N scale, I call it 030, because you only need three fingers to pick up an N scale car. Um, so I, I missed the island of Sodor. That, that will be my, my first attempt next time in 2027. So, so that was a lot of fun. I mean, we had two full operating sessions, and, and the yard produced, I think, four or five trains every session and I did not hear of anybody complaining any bit about it and so that was quite a bit of fun. Cool, so thank you very very much, thank you Brad for streaming and uh, the next NMRX will be the fourth Saturday in September, that's correct, I don't have the date right in front of me. Um, and if you have any uh, clinics you would like to present, we always need more people. It's, it's easy to do another hour. It's, it's, it's hard to do just one hour because Brad and Martin has to get up for all this. So thank you, Brad. Thank you, John. Thank you, yeah. audience, for watching. All right. Thank you, Martin.